that the title is Dueling Algorithms, and I think Nicole certainly deserves the prize for the best title today. Um, and I mean, well, Pizza's Lemons is also, I think that's the runner up. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think Nicole is number one, and Pizza's Lemons is number two. And what is this dominant strategy? This is so boring. I mean, you know, <laughs> 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 And uh, I give you Nicole. Uh, thank you. So this is joint work with uh, Adam Clyburn and Lucier, Anka Moitra, Andy Passaway, and Moshe Tenenholtz. Um, and uh, let me start the talk by discussing normal form games, which we all know and love. So in a normal form game, we have players that choose strategies in order to maximize their expected von Neumann Morgenstern utilities. So you can imagine that um, you, know, you have, say, somebody that wants to run a marathon, and they're choosing their strategy, which is like their training schedule, in order to get the best possible time in the marathon. Or maybe a biker in the Tour de France that's choosing the training schedule in order to get the best possible time in the Tour de France. Uh, so this would be a, the natural uh, normal form game corresponding to those settings. But of course, as you might imagine, uh, runners in a race or uh, bikers in the Tour de France might actually be trying to get the best placement possible in the race as opposed to the best possible time. And these are fundamentally different objectives. So it could be that the marathon runner doesn't care about his overall time uh, so much as his uh, time with respect to his peers. Or the Tour de France uh, bike racer wants to not get the best possible time, but he wants among his teammates the best possible time of the people of his teammates ought to be as uh, high as possible among the racers in the Tour de France overall. So this is what's known as a social context game. It was introduced by Ashlagi, Krista, and Tenenholtz in 2008. And in these games, players uh, are trying to get a particular payoff with respect to their peers. So they want to achieve a particular social status among their peers. Um, so you can imagine different sorts of aggregation functions. The marathon runner wants to get the minimum race time among all of his peers in the race. The Tour de France winner wants to get the minimum uh, for all of his teammates, so the weakest, uh, you know, his team is only as strong as its weakest link sort of uh, aggregation function. All of these are different types of social context that you might want to achieve with your, uh, von, uh, with your uh, von Neumann Morgenstern utility, and uh, you can aggregate these into a social context, and that's what gives you these social context games. Now. Um, of course, this is just another uh, normal form game, but considering it as a metagame like this allows us to study the impact of the social context on the uh, complexity of the game itself. Okay, so uh, these are general social context games. In this paper, we're gonna consider a special case of these that are called ranking games. This is like the marathon runner. Uh, this was studied first in a paper of Brent Fisher, Harenstein, and Schaum in 2008. And in these ranking games, we have that a uh, player cares about the rank of his utility with respect to those of his peers. So this is the marathon running example. And uh, we assume that people weakly prefer a lower rank, so you prefer to come in first to a higher rank, like second. And uh, then they assign particular uh, cardinal utilities to different ranks with that restriction. And uh, in the paper, they show that it's NP hard uh, to compute the Nash equilibria for more than three players in these sorts of ranking games. Now, a special case is of ranking games are the two-player ranking games. So here, I have just two people that are playing an underlying normal form game G, say Alice and Bob. and uh, all that they care about is how their score uh, compares to the, their opponent. 
So we say that the ranking game payoff of Alice, so the payoff of Alice in this meta game, in which uh, we wrap a ranking game around the normal form game G, the ranking game payoff of Alice is going to be 1 if she beats Bob in this game G. So she gets a higher payoff than Bob in the normal form game G. 1 half if she ties Bob, and 0 if she loses to Bob. So this induces another normal form game. Um, and it's a very simple normal form game here, right? We have a constant sum game. So we all know how to solve these games. The equilibria are very easy to compute using LPs. And we can do this in time polynomial in the size of the payoff matrix. Um, so this seems like an easy uh, solved problem. But zero sum games or constant sum games are not necessarily easy to compute when the, because in many interesting cases, the payoff matrix is implicit. And the si num size of the payoff matrix is exponential in the size of the input to the problem. So, uh, one example of this is succinct games, which was studied by Fortnow and Pagliazzo, Cabinets and Umens in 2008. And there they uh, considered when the payoff matrix is represented by a Boolean circuit, which could be logarithmic in the size of the uh, payoff matrix itself. Uh, and they showed that in such cases it could be uh, that Nash equilibria are hard to solve or even approximate. Uh, another example of this uh, are the Blotto games. So these were introduced uh, by Borel in 1921 and um, have been studied in a long sequence of papers, including Gross, Wagner, Robertson, and uh, Hart. And these games, uh, you can think about it as you have a bunch of battlefields and you have a fixed uh, number of armies. You have to decide how many armies to send to each battlefield. And now, uh, then, the, then the war is fought. And you, won, you win any battlefield in which you have more armies than your opponent. Okay? And uh, the goal here is you know, to collect as many battlefields as possible. So your utility is the number of battles that you win. So this is another constant sum game. But the number of strategies here is very large, because any assignment of armies to battlefields is a strategy for you. And so there's all this work has gone into computing the um, equilibrium strategies in this game uh, under various restrictions. And um, it's also been used, these games have been used to model the US uh, presidential election in 2000, in which uh, you, know, you, you had to win particular states as the presidential candidate. And so did Gore have a lot of strategy that would have won him the election. Um, so there's a paper that's looking at that. Uh, so these are examples of constant sum games in which the game itself is hard to solve. Uh, or uh, at least, I don't mean computationally hard, but it's not as simple as applying this sort of LP approach. Uh, we also have a, another uh, example of that in this paper uh, in which we have an implicit representation of a zero sum game. And we call these. Uh, the optimization duels. So in our paper, the underlying game is an optimization problem. And your goal is to optimize better than your opponent. Um, I'll introduce this through an example of a particular duel. And then I'll give you the general framework. So a duel that I have in mind is, for example, the ranking duel. So imagine that you're a search engine. You want to build a search engine. and uh, so there is some set of web pages, omega, that uh, you might return upon a particular query. And you know that each, the probability with which each web page is the correct page. So page i is the correct page with probability pi. Uh, and your goal is to take these, this set of n web pages and output a ranking of them, or a permutation pi, uh, that, is going to, that, that you're going to then present to the user. And what's your payoff for a particular permutation pi? Well, your goal should be to serve your user as best as possible. You're the only search engine, and this user is coming to you. You want to give them the uh, minimum search time that, that you can. So what you want to do is put the web page that they're looking for as high up as possible in the, in the rank. So you want to minimize the expected rank of the web page that the search that the searcher is using looking for. This is going to be the expectation 
over i that's selected according to this probability distribution p of the rank of page i, of pi of i. Uh, and so that's what would happen if you're the monopolist. But in the dueling setting, uh, you have a competitive objective. So you want to, you can imagine that you have this uh, searcher that's looking at two different web pages, and your goal is to be better for that searcher than the opposing search engine. So if you are outputting a ranking pi, and your opponent is outputting a ranking pi prime, then you are better for the searcher than your opponent if the page that they are looking for is ranked higher, I mean lower, like closer to the top, in your ranking than in your opponent's ranking. So uh, that's this part of your objective here. And then uh, if you rank the page at the same place as your opponent, we'll share uh, the payoff one half. Uh, so your objective is to output a ranking that maximizes your expected score given the algorithm of your opponent. All right, so let's uh, see how this plays out in a particular example. Um, we imagine that we have a user who's searching for an object that's drawn according to a known probability distribution. So here are the possible objects, the web pages that we could return. And we know that like, she's going to search for this pretty shape. And we know the probability with which each pretty shape appears in the search. Okay, So the square is the shape that she was looking for with probability 0.19, the star with probability 0.16, and so on. So now, if you're the only search engine in this world, what ranking would you propose? Yeah, maximum probability first, so the greedy ranking. We're going to rank the star, the diamond first because uh, it has the highest probability, and we're going to go on down the list. All right. Um, so greedy is optimal if you're a monopolist, and that's pretty easy to see. But now imagine that the following game happens. The user comes to this world, and there's Bing, and there's Google, and she wants to decide which search engine to use. So she just once performs this search for pretty shape on both Bing and Google, and she sees which one does a better job, and thereafter she always uses the search engine that did the better job on this single search. OK? Uh, so now this induces the dueling problem that I introduced before. So if you're Bing and you know that Google's doing this greedy thing, uh, what might you do to beat Google? Yeah, so you can just give up on the most popular item. So we push it down to the bottom, we lose whenever she's looking for the diamond, but it doesn't have the majority anyway, and we win on everything else. So uh, this shows that greedy is not optimal, I mean, it's not a, an equilibrium strategy in this game. And so there's a bunch of natural questions that arise. Can we, we know greedy is not an equilibrium strategy. Can we efficiently compute an equilibrium of this kind of duel? When you have two search engines dueling for a particular user, can I compute the equilibrium strategies? Uh, how poorly does the optimal algorithm perform in this kind of setting? How, how bad is it to use greedy? And uh, we saw that it, it's, you know, it can be beaten. How badly can it be beaten? And sort of another natural question for that would be, what are the consequences of using uh, you know, of this duel for the searcher. So this is a, a setting in which I have competition, and normally competition helps a user, helps the, the uh, you know, consumer, right? When you have competing companies, uh, it creates better and cheaper products for the consumer. Here we have a setting in which, because of the competition, the thing that would be optimal for the consumer, the greedy algorithm, is no longer in equilibrium. So what if, does the equilibrium look like for the user? Is it better or worse than greedy? And uh, how, by how much? OK, so these are the sort of natural questions that arise in this setting. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the computational aspects. We also discuss a little bit how badly the uh, optimal algorithm performs uh, in the dueling setting in the paper. And the third question is something that I think is a very nice 
uh, direction for future research. So uh, there are many optimization problems that can be considered as duals. I motivated this with the ranking example, but you can also imagine a bunch of them. Let me just tell you about my favorites. Uh, there's the hiring example in which you have uh, two companies or say two competing political parties and your objective is not to get the best candidate overall, but rather you want a candidate whose value to the public is better than that of your opponent. And if you go and select the best candidate overall, say by example, for example, by using the uh, secretary problem hiring algorithm, you're going to end up with uh, someone that can be beaten by your opponent who's using a strategy that's simply trying to beat you. Okay? So going for the best candidate might not be the best thing for you in the uh, hiring setting. Um, basically because you're giving up on getting the second best candidate. Uh, so that example is in the paper. I'm not going to discuss that. Compression I'll discuss later. So let me skip it for now. Uh, my favorite example here is the parking, which is that you're going into a parking garage and you're driving around looking for a place for your car and there's this really annoying guy in front of you that you know is just going to steal the spot as soon as he finds it. So you don't want to necessarily, you know, do the, the best possible search through this graph for the, for the empty spot. You just want to jump ahead of the guy that's in front of you and then uh, hope that the spot, you get to the spot before he does. So this is another example of an optimization problem as a dual. Uh, so the general framework is that you have some finite feasible set X of strategies. You can think about this as any algorithm for your optimization problem. And you have a probability distribution P over states of nature omega. So this is the probability distribution over the instance that's going to be presented to your algorithm to solve. Uh, and then there's some cost, some objective cost. That's the performance of your algorithm on some particular stage of nature. And the objective of the monopolist is to choose a, uh, a strategy or an algorithm that solves the problem, which is going to get the minimum expected cost with respect to the distribution over the states of nature. Now, in the dueling setting, you have two competing optimization algorithms, green and blue. Uh, the players both select strategies from the uh, strategy space X, so they both select their algorithms for this optimization problem. Then nature is going to select the input this, uh, for the algorithms, omega, according to the known probability distribution P. We uh, have our payoffs are realized once the uh, state of nature is selected and the payoff is computed to be uh, the payoff to the green player is one if his cost on the state that was selected is less than the cost of the blue player one zero if it's more and one half if they're equal um, so this is the general framework and I'll tell you very briefly about our computational results so we give an LP-based technique to compute the equilibria in these settings. Um, this is just a general sort of approach that you can apply. It's not, it doesn't solve all such problems. Uh, but it will, I'll show you how to apply this to the ranking setting. And we also give a uh, low regret learning technique that can be used to uh, uh, compute approximate equilibria when the LP-based technique doesn't uh, work out. Uh, so I'll show you how that works in the compression setting. Uh, and how does the, so the LP-based technique, how does this work? So we're going to basically use what you know about zero-sum games, that you, you can compute these minimax strategies using an LP approach. So the problem with applying that directly is that uh, the LP is going to have a size that's polynomial in the number of strategies. But the number of strategies in these settings is all possible algorithms. So what we're going to do is we're going to project these algorithms into Euclidean space. And uh, we're going to simply run the LP approach in this space that's very nice and small and compact. So we want to efficiently map our strategies, which are all possible algorithms, to points in Rn. 
Then we need to find some, con to find some constraints that describe the convex hull of these points. Now we're going to apply the mini max LP solution to this projected space. And uh, in order to do that, we need to make sure that there's a payoff matrix that computes the values in this projected space. Then we take, uh, you know, our solution is going to be some point in this convex hull K. So we need to know how to take that point and round it back to an algorithm in the original game or a strategy for the original game. Um, just a reminder, once you uh, project everything into this space, how do you find the minimax strategies? You're, what you have to do is you want to compute, so what is the minimax strategies? Uh, first of all, the cross product of minimax strategies are the Nash equilibria of a, of a constant sum game. Um, and the uh, minimax strategy says that, okay, I assume the world's out to get me. And what I want to do, my objective is to uh, guarantee myself as high a value as I can, given that everybody is out to kill me. So what do you want to do? You want to get as high a value V as possible, uh, given that, uh, so you want to pick your strategy X that guarantees as high a possible value V against any strategy X prime of your opponent. So no matter what your opponent plays, you get at least V. And you want that to be as high as possible, and you can pick some mixed strategy. So this is the standard approach for solving zero-sum games. The uh, contribution here is, or the main you know, task in this paper is going to be how to project our original game into this space, uh, Rn. And OK, so this LP is still exponential because uh, there's exponentially many your strategy is x prime of your opponent, but um, you can it, use duality to write in a polynomial sized LP because uh, the projected space has only polynomially many variables. Okay, so uh, let's see how this works out for the ranking dual. This is sort of the simplest dual in the paper. Uh, we do it for other ones. You can read the paper to see how to apply it to other settings, but for the ranking dual, what happens is that we efficiently map strategies to points in Rn. How do we do that? Uh, we use permutation matrices. So remember, in the ranking dual, I'm supposed to output a permutation. I can represent a permutation as a point in Rn by uh, a matrix in which the ijth entry is the, indicates is 1 if item i is placed in position j. Okay. So now any permutation matrix gives me a permutation or ranking of the items. The rows are the items or the web pages. The columns are the position at which the web page is going to appear. And uh, one in ij means that web page i is ranked at position j. Uh, now I want to define uh, constraints that describe the convex hull of this matrix, uh, the set of permutation matrices. This is just the doubly stochastic matrices. So those matrices in which uh, the entries are all between 0 and 1, and the uh, rows sum to 1, and the columns also sum to 1. Okay, um, now we have the, uh, we have to, we, we're going to be able to, you know, I'll show you later how to write the payoff matrix, but once I finish uh, solving that LP that I showed you, I'm going to end up with a point in the convex hull. So I'm going to end up with a doubly stochastic matrix. I need to round this back to a strategy in my original game. And in order to do that, I can apply the Birkhoff von Neumann theorem. So this theorem says that given any point in the convex hull of the permutation matrices, I can efficiently construct a convex combination of the vertices of this polytope. So I can efficiently uh, represent it as a convex combination of permutation matrices. Uh, and then that will define for me a mixed strategy in my original game. So in my original game, I just select one of those rankings according to the probabilities that are indicated by the coefficients in the convex combination. So the rounding back uh, step is is clear. And uh, finally, you just have to check that you can write a payoff matrix that faithfully represents the payoffs of two different permutation matrices, uh, 
permutations with respect to each other. And this is not too hard to see. Basically, the payoff of playing, uh, so y i j here is a, um, y is a doubly stochastic matrix. And your payoff for playing this doubly stochastic matrix versus the y prime one is the sum over all web pages i that might occur, the probability that one occurs, uh, times the uh, payoff you get for that particular one, which is going to be the sum over all j of the position at which you place a web page i times one half if that opponent also places a web page i in the same position j plus one if that opponent places web page i in any position k that's greater than the position j that you selected. Okay, so this is um, bilinear and uh, in y and y prime, and so there is some matrix M which we can use to write it as y transpose M y prime. Okay, so this is, uh, completes the reduction for the ranking dual. I've taken a game that had n factorial strategies, a zero-sum game that had n factorial strategies, uh, and I've projected it into a space with, uh, that was polynomial in n, which is the number of web pages, and I showed you how to compute the equilibrium in time polynomial in n, as opposed to polynomial in n factorial, which the brute force uh, approach would have given you. And this technique also applies to uh, some of the other duals I mentioned in the introduction. Um, so in my last five minutes, I will briefly sketch the, uh, what happens when this approach fails. So in the compression duel, I don't know how to apply this approach. What is the compression dual? Um, you, each player, instead of outputting a permutation, is going to output a tree. And the, this, you can think about this as the compression tree. Okay, so uh, each symbol here is a symbol that's in some big document that you want to compress. And these trees give you the encodings for these symbols in the document. And your goal is to have a smaller compression. So uh, when the user is going to test how good your compression scheme is by selecting one of these shapes with probability uh, equal to this known distribution p and testing its depth in your tree. And then it's going to select the tree that has, in which this one shape has a lower depth. The classical algorithm here, as we all know, is Huffman coding. And this one repeatedly pairs nodes with lowest probability in order to get a tree that uh, minimizes that objective. Um, in the dual, if I want to apply the approach I told you before, I should efficiently map strategies to points in Rn and define constraints that give me the convex hull of those points. So these are going to, I could try, I mean, this is not going to work. I don't know how to make this work. But I could try doing something like I did before. I could try saying, well, let's have a matrix X for the uh, mapping of, of these trees. And uh, what's a tree look like in matrix form? It has a, I, the rows are the items, the leaves of the trees. And the columns are the depths. And I have a 1 in uh, entry ij if item i is placed at depth j in my tree. That would be a fine representation. And it would let me write that payoff matrix easily. Um, and then I could also you know, look at the induced uh, convex hull. But the hard thing is that uh, you know, I, I don't know how to describe this subset here. This subset has to correspond to a depth profile in some binary tree. And it's not true that any matrix gives me the depth profile in some binary tree. Right? I can't put all items at depth 1, for example. So this approach fails um, because I don't know how to describe these binary trees in uh, space Rn succinctly. And, uh, and maybe it can be done. I just don't know how to do it. Instead, we are able to compute approximate equilibria using uh, a reduction to approximate best responses. So our goal is to compute an approximate minimax strategy for each player, in being one in which my strategy guarantees me a payoff not worse than my best possible value minus epsilon. And in order to do that, I can reduce the problem to one of computing approximate best responses. An approximate best response says that, uh, you know, I, I'm going to play a response to your strategy that guarantees me 
uh, a payoff of not worse than the payoff of the best response minus epsilon. Um, and so in order to do that, uh, like uh, basically the idea is to use an approximate best response oracle to get approximate minimax strategies. And this works because we have a low regret learning sequence. So imagine I can produce a low, I, I'm going to use the approximate best responses to get a low regret learning sequence. And then my averages of my low regret learning sequences are going to be approximate minimax strategies. A low regret learning sequence is one in which I can't replace any one of these uh, by a pure strategy throughout in order to get better uh, payoff. And um, in order to get a low regret learning sequence, I just need to play a best response to all, everything that happened before me. Okay, so the basic story is that if we can compute approximate best responses, then we can compute approximate equilibria. In the compression game, uh, the approximate best responses can be computed using multiple choice knapsack. So what is multiple choice knapsack? It says given lists of items that have values and weights, I want to pick at most one item from each list. Uh, in order to maximize my total value subject to my total weight being at most one. So I'm robbing a store, I can pick at most one item from each shelf, and my, I don't want the items to overfill my knapsack, uh, and I want to get as much weight as possible. So here, the lists are the rows, and uh, so I want to pick the triangle to be at most, at, and the columns are depth, so I can pick the triangle to be at one of these depths, one through four, and the circle to be at one of these depths, the square to be at one of these depths, and the star to be at one of these depths. Um, the value of having the triangle at depth j is the probability that I win if I place them at depth j, given the x prime of my opponent that I'm trying to best respond to. Uh, so you can just compute this probability. And uh, I'm going to assign a weight to an item at depth j to be 2 to the minus j. Now the craft inequality tells me that if all of these weights sum to at most 1, then there is some binary tree that uh, I can arrange these items into, such that each item is at its appropriate depth. Um, so I'm, in conclusion, I, there's a bunch of other duels that I mentioned at the beginning that we discuss in the paper. And you can check the paper for those. It's on archive. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I think one of the very interesting open questions here is to sort of understand what effect these dueling games have on the uh, user of the search engine or whatever optimization problem you're trying to solve. So to answer this, like, you know, the, the solution I gave for computing equilibria is some mixed strategy that I don't understand very well. Like, I, I don't know what it looks like. I can't describe it to you. I can just compute it. I don't have an intuition of what it looks like. In order to study the effect of the dual solution on the optimization problem, you really have to understand what this looks like. And I've done a little bit of work on this for the ranking dual, and I can come up with statements like, if item j occurs with a much higher probability than item i, then j can't be very far below i in the rank, you know, the expected rank of j can't be very far below i in this symmetric equilibria that we compute here. Um, so statements like those will help you answer this question. Thank you. So more than two players, everything falls apart because um, I'm very, using very heavily that I have zero-sum games here, at least in computing the exact equilibria. And uh, it even becomes just hard for more than two players. It's as hard as a general game now. Because I can have a third player soak up all the leftover payoff. Um, I don't, I, so if you were talking about a ranking game, then maybe we can assign particular cardinal utilities to different ranks and then get some leverage out of that. If, 
it's just like if I'm allowed to assign any utility to each rank, I think I, it'll be NP hard to do anything. Yeah, so um, this, I, I, we don't have a formal statement of that form, but it seems like uh, the racing duel in which you have a start and a finish, you know, you and your boss are driving to work from the same neighborhood, you just want to get there before your boss. Uh, that game uh, appears to be computationally hard to compute the equilibrium. I mean, at least we weren't able to solve it. <laughs> we didn't try to prove formally that it's hard, but in, of course, to to do the single player problem to you just minimize your expected time here that you know the roads, roads have, have different, different distributions, distributions of edge, edge delays. delays. 